I'm very pleased to introduce the person who graciously put this event together, Govin Nair, class of 1983. Govin has had a long career in business and he's an invaluable volunteer for Reed, where he sits on the alumni board and currently is the co-chair of the Reed Career Alliance. The RCA advocates for career assistance for all years of alumni, be it mid-career, retiring, changing careers, or just starting out. And Govind has been instrumental in spearheading a series of virtual events exploring career pathways during this pandemic. Govin, thank you so much for putting uh, together today's event and please take it away. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Katie, and good day to all you readies joining us. Uh, I'm Govind Nair, Reed class of 83. Um, I was an economics major, and as Katie said, I'm co-chair of the Reed Career Alliance. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to welcome you all to this third event in our alumni Zoom panel series on career pathways, which began last summer. And if this is the first time you're attending, let me very quickly explain what this is all about. As Katie was saying, we target all alumni as well as current students as our audience. And whether you're contemplating a career in the early stages of one in career transition, or if you're simply interested in finding out what our fellow readies are doing with their read education. We generally do three things with each event. We first get to know our, our alums uh, on the panel better, understand their individual motivations and decisions and personal trajectories toward and along a career pathway. Second, we get to hear from them, their insights in a specific area under discussion. Today, it's about creative arts. And finally, we get to talk a little bit also about what role a read education may have played in encountering, enabling, or adapting to various uh, career opportunities. So uh, today, it's all about uh, the creative arts. And with that as a background, let us get our panel to introduce themselves by stating their names, class years, majors, and briefly, what artistic field they are currently in. We will proceed alphabetically. Let me start with you, Aaliyah. So my name is Aaliyah Adigweme. I graduated from Reed in 2006 with a degree in Russian literature. Um, I'm currently based in Los Angeles. Uh, and I would say that my area of art is pretty anti-disciplinary in that I, I tend to dabble. Okay, thank you, Aaliyah. Uh, Marissa, you're next. Unmute there. Hi, my name is Marisa Aparicio Tovar. I graduated in 2009 uh, with a degree in anthro anthropology. And um, yeah, my art is, um, it's uh, mostly hand-drawn digital, um, very nature inspired. And I just finished a tarot deck set I'm excited about. And uh, yeah, I make prints and art, just hope, hoping to share curiosity and love for a natural environment. Thank you, Marissa. Over to you, Dave. I'm Dave Baxter. I graduated in 87 in psychology. Uh, I currently live in the DC area. Um, I'm a member of the alumni board. I serve on the committee for the young alumni and I'm also a DC chapter uh, steering committee member. And my form of art is stained glass and fused glass. And I've been doing that for about 10 years. Um, I've also taught um, classes in stained glass locally, um, which of course is on hold right now because of the pandemic. Okay, thank you, Dave. And finally to you, Taya. Hey, my name is Taya Koshnik and I graduated in 2004 and I still live in Portland. And I started a jewelry company here in Portland in 2007 called Tassi Designs. And I started a second jewelry company in 2014 called Stowaway Jewelry. And we also own, a, own and operate a store here in Portland in the Selwood neighborhood. Okay. And my, you, major, was, and uh, my okay. major was English and creative writing. Thank you, Taya. Sorry, we had I had a bit of a delay here. Thank you. And all the panelists, uh, thank you for introducing yourselves. So uh, let us now uh, talk a bit uh, about, um, about what you actually uh, are doing uh, in your artistic uh, careers. Uh, and um, let, me, um, let me talk a bit first about the uh, Center for Life Beyond Read, because they talk a lot about 
finding one's purpose as students explore career paths, as you all know. Now, all of us with a passion also find it challenging as we drive ourselves to make or build or express ourselves through any venture, let alone a creative arts career. So what I want to ask our panelists is this, what surprised you about your path while pursuing art as a creative, uh, as a career or a creative endeavor? Can you, can we start with you, Aaliyah? Sure, uh, I think the thing that surprised me most about pursuing art as a creative you know, or career endeavor would be that I pursued it at all. I didn't study art at, um, at Reed. I did participate in RAW, uh, Reed Arts Week a couple of times, but for the most part, the art that I did, I was not necessarily secretive about, but I didn't show it. I didn't really consider myself an artist. I just took photographs and made collages out of junk mail when I worked at the mail room. Um, and so for me, really it was the decision, finding out that there was no way around it really. I took a creative writing class, um, second semester of my senior year with Pete Rock in nonfiction. And that led me to eventually after a three year break, uh, get a nonfiction writing MFA at the University of Iowa. After that, I took another three years off, worked as a waitress, worked as an adjunct, taught English language acquisition, um, and then ended up in a PhD program in communication studies. I was there for three years that took a year off and then I ended up in an MFA program in visual art. And so my path to art as a career to being an artist is a thing that I call myself, I think has been very circuitous and it hasn't always been the type of kind of uh, identity or the type of career path that I've claimed because it is such a challenging thing, I think to, to decide to do for a living, it requires a, I think an immense amount of passion for what you do, of course, but also it, it involves a fair amount of risk. And so I think that, you know, coming from a family that didn't necessarily value art as something that you would do for a living, like I was supposed to be like a doctor, lawyer, or engineer or something. Um, it was really challenging, I think, for me to decide to do it. And then once I decided to do it, I think it was just a question of making sure that I always focused on what was of interest to me. And that's oh. been relatively easy. Great, thank you, Aaliyah. Uh, Dave, um, I don't suppose you have the same answer to this question. No, like most of us, um, I have a circuitous path. Um, and mine took a lot longer than Aaliyah's to get to because I'm just a bit older than she is. Um, but what surprised me most, I guess, is um, how much fun this can be. Um, you know, it's um, it's the kind of thing where, um, like most readers, I tend to be kind of, uh, you know, you lack confidence sometimes in what you do. But once I started doing this, I realized, well, geez, not only is this fun, but also mistakes really aren't bad. Um, in fact, in my case, mistakes are things that can turn out to be beautiful pieces of work. Um, so when I have a problem with a piece of glass because it breaks in the kiln because I didn't do something correctly, I can crush it up and use it again. And um, so nothing in my world uh, gets thrown out, <laughs> as my other half will tell you for sure. <laughs> Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Dave. Um, now, Taya, can we get your perspective on this? Sure, yeah. Um... I also did not set out uh, to be an artist after I graduated from Reed, but um, I making jewelry was something that I always did. My mom is a jeweler, so I remember, you know, even when I was five years old, helping her in her studio. And we, uh, my family is really creative, and we we were always making things, and so it was just kind of part of our lives. And I started selling jewelry when I did my first craft fair when I was 12. And I remember I made $100 on the first day and I was like, this is it, this is what I'm gonna do, you know? But those dreams kind of, you know, fell into the background, of course, once I was in high school and college, but I was always making and selling jewelry as a side hustle. 
And I remember when I was at Reed, I was still selling jewelry. I, I used to bring jewelry, like a bag of jewelry with me to my uh, meetings with professors and try to sell jewelry to them, which is probably inappropriate, but I made some good sales. And, and then I also sold my jewelry at the Paradox while I was at Reed. So um, yeah, after Reed, I, I moved to New Orleans right after Reed, uh, which was right before Hurricane Katrina. So my kind of life plan that I had was totally just, um, it totally blew up. And so I, I moved back to Portland and I decided to just kind of take a few years to figure out what I was going to do. And I was just still selling jewelry all the time. And um, I just kept telling myself, oh, I'll just keep selling it for another year and, and then I'll decide what I'm going to do, you know, if I'm going to go to grad school or what's going to happen. But it ended up being a really exciting time in Portland. In 2006 and seven, there was a huge craft movement that was happening in Portland and a lot of awesome boutiques and craft fairs were starting and Etsy was new and there was just a lot of momentum and a really awesome community here. And so my sales were always growing year after year. And um, at some point, I think maybe probably six or seven years ago, I decided to, you know, like step back and ask myself, like, is this really my path? Is this really what I'm going to do? And I decided that I really did love it and I wanted to see how far I could take it. And, and that was a really pivotal time for me. I, um, I ended up, that was when I hired my first full-time staff and we just started, um, you know, I started putting as much energy as I could into it. And, you know, it just felt like the more energy I put into it, the more I got out of it. And it just kind of grew organically. And it was, it, it's been an exciting ride, but it definitely wasn't what I set out to do. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Taya. Uh, Marissa, let me ask you the question maybe a little differently. What role has art played in your life? Uh, wow, those are a lot of really good uh, stories. I enjoyed hearing you guys. Um, uh, art in my life, um, I guess, you know, for, for as long as I can remember since childhood and uh, especially during rough uh, high school and read years, uh, art has pretty much been like my medicine. Um, it's, it's, you know, whether it's through illustrating or making music, um, art has always been my, my grounding. And uh, yeah, it's, um, it's pretty central and essential to my life and my health and well being. Um, and I feel that it's part of that power that art has is what I also try to share with my work. But yeah, it's, did that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marisa. No, thank you. Now, thank you. And, you know, we've now got to know our panelists a little bit, at least in terms of how they've come to the world of creative arts. So let's uh, probe, probe this a bit further uh, with respect to their specific experiences. So let me go back to you, uh, Taya, and ask you, what pressures have you faced as an artist and how have they changed over time? Yeah, um, that's a good one. Um, I think that, you know, for the first, maybe I, I found in my business officially in 2007 and um, I hadn't been out of college that long. And so a lot of my friends and family were still finding their paths and deciding what they wanted to do. and it was kind of this big question of like, is this really, you know, what you want to do? And I felt like it was some days and like, it wasn't other days. And, and so I felt, and, and then also, you know, I think some people don't take the craft and art world as seriously as we do, and they don't find it as important as we do, but I, it was a good, path for me to kind of realize that I, I do really love this industry and I care about it and it's important to me and I find it endlessly engaging and exciting so you know if, at first I felt pressure to kind of justify why I was in this on this path and in this world but um 
I think once I really kind of embraced it, I, those pressures have fallen away more because I, I feel proud of what we've done and that's exciting. And then, uh, you know, of course, if you're talking about pressures and challenges, 2020 has just been an absolute, you know, wild, horrible roller coaster, as I'm sure we've all experienced. So it's a pretty hard time to be, I think, in the art world and the luxury goods world, especially. Uh, so it's been it's been an interesting year, uh, lots of highs and lows, but it's also been a great like step back for me because the business was kind of on this really great growth period for so long. And so to have that taken away, you really you have an interesting time to to take a step back and and to kind of reevaluate what you want out of this path and and um, you know look at what's working and what isn't working. So it's been a, it's actually ended up being an exciting time for reinvention for me. But there were definitely some periods you know around uh, June and July that felt like uh, we weren't gonna make it through. So that's been a lot of a uh, hard pressure to get through, but I, I'm feeling really hopeful now. Great, okay, sure. So we are hearing a lot about passion, but we're also hearing some sobering experiences, particularly in these recently, you know, very difficult times. Let's maybe turn to some specific um, pieces of work that our panelists have done and uh, maybe ask them what they see as pivotal works uh, in their lives as artists. Um, Alia, would you like to share with us one of your significant works? Sure. I think, you know, one of my most significant works for me is actually relatively recent. Um, but I think that it's really opened up another door for me in terms of the different mediums that I work in and what it really looks like to do work. Um, and that's been completely due to the pandemic, um, which I'm sure has, like, as Taya said, affected us in a number of different ways, um, you know, in our practices and in the way that we, we sell our work. Um, but I have really switched to mostly doing digital, you know, work as opposed to making objects, as opposed to um, doing any painting um, over the course of the pandemic, because the graduate art studio has been closed. Um, I've been sheltering in place. Um, you know, pretty hard since March because of pre-existing conditions. And so for me, I started working a lot with film, which I'd only really worked with once before. Um, and, you know, feeling like that wasn't necessarily a thing that I trained to do, but I've been teaching myself Premiere Pro and trying to figure out how that works. Um, and so I think a pivotal work for me is a film that I currently have screening in the New Orleans Film Festival. Um, until Sunday. Um, and so it screened in the experimental short film category. It lost, <laughs> but it actually was an honor to be nominated, <laughs> like for real. Um, because, you know, New Orleans, I guess, is known for having a really tight curatorial focus where they do a lot of work to uplift and distribute, you know, works by people of color, you know, queer folks, um, Southern artists in particular. Um, and they do that without really sacrificing the kind of breadth of films that they carry in their festival, but also the kind of quality. And so I was really um, kind of awestruck and surprised. And also it made me really reconsider um, how, just how seriously I take myself, I guess. Um, wow. And so that, for me, is something that's pretty, pretty pivotal. That's that's very interesting. I hope we get to hear more about the reception of your film after the screening. Um, you know, uh, do let us know about it. Thank you, Alea. Uh, Dave, can we go to you? Can you share with us one of your creations or talk about it, uh, which is especially meaningful to you as an artist? I sure can. So let me see if this works here. Yep, okay. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, awesome. So um, actually start that. So one of the things I've always been interested in is some of the natural forms in the world, particularly things like trees and tree bark. So I set out in 2016 to make tree bark out of glass. And this is uh, sort of the process. And I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because I don't have a whole lot of time. So I do apologize for that. 
Um, but um, I learned that you can use powdered glass to actually make tree bark. So what I do is I take a bunch of glass that's in powder form, it's about the consistency of sand, and I layer it in the kiln. And from that, I get something like what you see on the screen here. So let me go through this a little bit. So surface tension causes glass to be, to seek out a, seek a thickness of about three millimeters. So if you think of a drop of water, it's the same principle. Sur surface tension causes that to round out. And when glass is hot, it wants that thickness to be three millimeters. So if you have pieces of glass that are thicker than that, they spread out. If they're thinner than that, they suck together. And that process can cause um, the glass to form in a different way based on how thickness. Um, so to do this, I, I heat it up in the kiln to about 1400 degrees. Um, I use different colors of glass, sometimes a lot of small chunks or broken glass. So, so since they're a little bit thicker and denser, things tend to gather around them. So you get things like this or like this or like this. So what I do is I take all those components and I stack them together on top of each other. And this temperature is much lower. And the idea is to get just get the glass to stick to itself. Um, now this isn't a very good example on the right of your screen there, but it sort of shows you what happens. Um, you get textures, you get um, things that look close to what bark might look like. Um, so I learned a whole bunch while I was doing this. Um, first of all, careful regulation when you run when you're running the kiln is very very important. I had lots of failures. Um, this project took literally hundreds of hours lots of time in the kiln um, and I learned quite a bit about temperature and glass while I was doing that. Um, I also learned how to ca cast glass into a mold that include making my own mold um, and I also learned which colors work best for my purposes. And this is what I got out of this process which is pretty cool. Um, so that centerpiece there is a cast piece the the uh, oak leaf and um, the three panels under it are all examples of where I use those components to make the glass look like bark. Um, here's a close up just so you can see it. So it, ha it has a lot of texture. It doesn't photograph very well, unfortunately, but it does have a lot of texture. Um, and part of the reason this was so pivotal because um, it's one step in a process that I am trying to perfect and the idea is uh, ultimately to make a sculpture that is, has a base of copper um, pipes and wires and things that take on a tree shape and that will be encased in glass. Um, but that's, again, that's a long-term project that um, is probably beyond the scope of what I'm talking about today, but this is one of those steps along the way. Okay, all right, thank you so much, Dave. You know, this is one of those times where, you know, I realize face to face is such a wonderful thing, and I, you know, wish we could all see your your wonderful artworks, see your film, Malia, you know, talk to you and feel your passion, all of you, <laughs> about what you're uh, doing. Uh, maybe let's uh, zoom out uh, a little bit and ask a broader question: What role does art play in society? And more specifically, and I'm going to direct this to you, Maritza, uh, how does your art uh, relate to the world? How do you see that? Oh, <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, it's, it's been, it's been quite the path to get to the point to start sharing my work. And one of the main things that really, um, motivated me to, to start was me being pretty unhappy. <laughs> with a regular job and uh, just, I had never really had a regular job. I was seasonal for a decade with outdoor work. And um, so the past couple years, you know, I, I just really, really felt drawn to just like the mantra of like, you know, live a life you love because really, you know, all we have is the moment. Um, so I, I, it's, it's with, 
it's my hope that um, the work that I create, um, especially the the gentle tarot that I just um, finished, um, I really hope that um, my work can inspire others to reflect on their life and what, you know, if we can all, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> this is very new for me to share life, but um, yeah, you know, if, if we can all really connect with ourselves and tune into what we need and how we're feeling and how we're doing, what our health, mental and physical well-being is like, um, I really believe we can be much more constructive and like function together as a species for the wellness of the planet. And um, I feel like it all starts with the individual and I, I really hope that my art can, or you know, it's all art, you know, seeks connection. But I, I just, I guess I hope it can it be that for people to be that inspiration and be a draw to that kind of connection to to really um, help the world be a better place. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Maritza. That's that's a very warm message. And you know, thank you all. You're bringing so much of you know the personal side. This is a very personal conversation in many ways. And um, you know, we've talked about your biography, your your personal journeys. We've talked about some of the aesthetic aspects and social aspects of your work. Uh, can we go back to the business side, um, which we began talking about a little bit, particularly in this very challenging context, all of us find ourselves in one way or the other, but this particularly, I think, touches the art world, among others. I would like to hear from each of you, each of our panelists, how you seek out opportunities to promote your work. And can you also share, for the benefit of our audience, uh, a bit about the pros and cons about how you market your art. Uh, can we start with you, Alea? Yeah, um, <laughs> this is actually, I think one of the things I do the least well, um, this part, the, the kind of marketing part, the promoting work part, the talking about yourself part. Um, I'm a hermit recluse, and so that doesn't necessarily, and an introvert, that doesn't necessarily lend well to, um, you know, promoting oneself or doing the type of labor that one needs to do in order to be, like, be successful, in quotation marks. Um, however, I find that opportunities tend to come my way um, when I am embedded in a community I care about. Um, that, I think, you know, I lived in Iowa City, Iowa for 10 years and, you know, was there doing an MFA program. And so that gave me an in in some ways to into the, the art community. But it was really when I started waiting tables and my good friend who was a bartender was, you know, managing editor for the local Alt Weekly when I actually got to start kind of publishing a little bit more and writing a little bit more. Um, and, you know, opportunities have generally kind of come my way um, similarly, even though I've moved to Los Angeles now, I've you know found a really kind of caring community, um, you know, within the kind of larger population of my colleagues in the graduate program, you know, at UCLA. But it's you know that those relationships really that help me to do the work of getting my work out there a little bit more, either by encouraging me to be, I think, a little bit more not serious, but to take myself more seriously. Um, and to take more chances, but also I think, um, you know, if you're a community member and you're interested in other people's work and your work is interesting, um, people will think of you when they have opportunities. Um, and I think that that is something that's really important because it can often be framed for art as like, you have to like be kind of cutthroat, like you have to be, you have to really want it. And it's like, I think that you can really want it while still being really attentive to having an ethics of care in terms of the way that one approaches art making and community. Um, and that I think can, can lead to a market that one might not even kind of know about, but also you have to have like a website <laughs> and 
and yeah. like post to the social media and all that stuff too. I don't want to make it too pie in the sky. Yeah. Uh, Aaliyah, thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that uh, uh, with us. Uh, Maritza, uh, a completely, uh, you know, different, um, uh, different perspective on uh, creative arts than what you've been talking about up till now. What about the business side? How do you see it? Oh, the business side is is the tough side. <laughs> um, I'm also really new to having to promote my work and build a website. And uh, it's, um, I think I just want to echo a little bit of what Aliyah just said. And, you know, I feel like creating something that you really feel is meaningful and authentic really helps. Um, I think it helps people be drawn to it. And, um, but in terms of, you know, the business, I honestly, I, I try to, I've reached out to other artists in similar fields and have been lucky to have some of them respond and be really, really supportive and helpful. And I've also spent time um, online, like looking for websites and like blogs, especially with my recent tarot project, um, just really kind of diving in. <laughs> head first and um, putting as much time into it as I can. Um, but uh, yeah, it's tough. A lot of times you end up spending hours uh, sending out a lot of emails to people you don't know and you just get a couple back, but um, it's really helpful when they do. And, um, you know, also like my, my local radio station was very supportive and they did an interview with me and that kind of got my work out. Um, and then other radio stations throughout Alaska picked up the story. So I think if, you know, you start with what you have and reach out to different media venues and um, yeah, it takes, it takes a lot of time, but, um, and I'm just starting, but that's all I've known to do in that. That's what's helped me so far. Okay, thank you. I mean, I hear I hear your endeavor, your persistence, uh, the energy that you, you're putting into this. Uh, Dave, uh, what are your thoughts uh, on this um, business aspect of your work? So my response is gonna be more nuts and bolts um, because um, for example, unlike Aaliyah and Marissa, I found that a, a website does not benefit me um, because first of all, I see a lot of competition out there. Um, there's a lot of people doing glass. Um, they've been doing it for a lot longer, some of them longer than I've been alive. Um, but kind of to pick up on what something Nalia said, um, when you have something that's unique, you get noticed. When you have, when you have something that is one of a kind and can't be replicated, then, um, that's when your work tends to get noticed and you try to, you start to become more successful. Um, uh, I've, I've watched um, folks at craft fairs and things like that before, and they sit behind their booths, reading their books, doing whatever they're doing, and they're not actively engaging in their customers. Um, so to be successful, that's one of the things you do have to do well is promote yourself. Um, you know, when, people come by my booth, I say hello to every single person um, because that's the way you get noticed. And, they, and it's, it's said in a genuine, you know, not, hi, how you doing? Hi, how you doing? Hi, how you doing? It's, you know, it's a genuine hello, how you doing today? You know, come take a look at my stuff kind of way of talking to folks. Um, and I primarily right now promote my work on Instagram because my work is visual. Um, I did have a website for a while. It didn't work out very well because it's, it's a lot of upkeep for very little sales. Um, I, if I need to sell something on a more um, long-term basis, I put stuff on Etsy um, and I've, I'm sort of being forced back into Etsy now because of the pandemic. Um, a lot of my events have been canceled. Um, so sort of in some ways, I would say that more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, you know, I, I started out on Etsy and I went to in-person. Now I'm back on Etsy because I have to be. Um, and I, I think one of the things that um, you have to look at is what your competition is doing and what can set you apart from your competition. And if you can do that successfully, then you will be successful. 
Okay, that's a, that's a very hopeful message, uh, Dave. Uh, thank you. Uh, Taya, I, I know you began talking about some of the uh, challenges in this uh, new pandemic environment uh, and you know some of your adaptational uh, experiences. Um, what thoughts um, would you like to share um, on these uh, business aspects and the creative arts? Yeah, um, I think uh, for me, the business side is a really exciting part of what we do. And I, I love, I'm a math person, so I love looking at the numbers and, you know, trying to be strategic. And for me, um, you know, our business, my business really started to be successful once we started tracking everything we could. And I think it can be hard in a, um, when you're in a creative field, because creativity feels like this nebulous thing that is, you know, it's hard to pin down. And it, it certainly is that, but I was really surprised when I started tracking what was selling and, and how we were selling it, that certain patterns did emerge and they appear to be true year after year. And so um, that has helped us kind of double down on what's working and to trim what isn't working. And um, it, it can also be a fun design challenge to kind of fill the gaps, like what's working and what's missing in this category, et cetera. Um, but, for me, you know, the math part is exciting and I find that to be pretty different than the marketing side, which I don't love. Uh, marketing is definitely the biggest challenge. And that for me is challenging because I can be a pretty private person. And I think that a lot of people who follow artists and crafters want that piece of, you know, the inspiration behind it. And you know, who made this art and what are they up to? And so it can be hard for me to share parts of my personal life when, if you're, you know, on social media or whatever. Um, and so that's a constant challenge because the more we do share those things, the greater our sales are for sure. So it's kind of like working out the balance that you feel comfortable with on that aspect. And then, um, I've also found, you know, over the years, it can be challenging from a marketing perspective if you are all in on one platform, like, because at first we were really successful on Etsy and then they changed their algorithm. And then we were really successful on Instagram and they changed their algorithm. And so for us, the, the thing that has remained constant for us that is that our best way to market is having an email list and just having people sign up who are willing to follow you is, I've been surprised, you know, now that I've been doing this for 13 years, we have a pretty incredible group of people who are willing to receive our emails, which I'm always surprised by because, you know, who doesn't hate spam, but that's exciting because you have control over it. So for anyone starting out, I would say, even if you aren't sure what your medium is or where you're going to end up, just start that email list and get people who want to follow you because then you're not tied to one platform or another. Okay. All right, Taya, thank you. And thank you uh, to all the panelists on this round. Um, you know, you're, as I say, you're putting a lot of your personal energy uh, into answering uh, these questions. Um, I want to get, uh, I want to get a bit more, I, I want to pretend to stand in the shoes of the audience who might be interested in starting a career like the ones you have been following or transitioning their hobby into a business. So what I'd like to do now is to ask each of you a specific question from this uh, vantage point. And let me go back to you, uh, Marissa. What do you wish you had known at the beginning of your career that you know now? Yeah. Um, I definitely, definitely say that I wish I would I would have known how easy the start was. Um, I feel like it took a lot. It took like too many years for me to get to the point where I actually started sharing and selling my work. Um, and I think a lot of the hesitation just came from like the unknown. Um, but really, you just you you learn as you go. And I feel like it took. Um, it took a lot of um, working in other fields and, but honestly, 
it it all started with a simple thing. Like I just started by selling two sticker designs <laughs> at my local museum here in Alaska. And, uh, and that's all it took. And it's just like from stickers, I went to cards and I, you know, I just, there's a lot of risk, but I feel like that's another thing that I wish I would have known was like the exciting part, at least for me, um, like the, financial risks are they actually kind of like invigorate me and make me motivated to to make things happen so yeah I guess I wish I would have known that it's it's it, it all it takes is just to to push the go button and you know and uh and yeah not don't don't worry and just try okay well thank you Marissa for looking back and sharing some of your insights you know with that wealth of experience you now have uh let me turn to alia uh alia can you talk uh about three skills that have served you well as an artist and maybe one that hasn't sure i think that's a complicated question um but i think one of the skills that served me really well is um being open to um other people's takes on my work being being able to take kind of criticism um being able to but also being able to tell when someone is in my audience and when someone is not so because all of my answers to this question have a ton of uh parentheticals <laughs> by the way um because it is complicated and so knowing how to take criticism is really really important but at the same time like sometimes your work just won't be for certain people and it's not, I think, it's helpful to hear that at the same time. I think it's really important not to take that to heart because not everything is for everyone and that's okay. You know, um, for instance, with the video they got into the film festival, one of my professors, when I showed it to her said, oh, that video needs a lot, a lot, a lot of work. Okay, like that video <laughs> wasn't for her and that's fine. If I had took, you know, taken that criticism to heart, I don't think I would have ended up submitting. I would have continued to tinker. Um, a couple of other skills that I think have served me well, um, being interested in other people's work um, and consuming culture um, almost agnostically, but also, you know, voraciously. Um, and so that I think is really important, like getting to know not only your competition, but people whose work is in your field or allied with your field who are making things that are cool to you. I think that's not only a way to kind of form connection, but it can be really generative in a lot of ways as well. Um, third, I would say um, accepting myself and how I work and not pathologizing it, um, but instead learning to work with it. Um, I'm not a morning person. For a long time, I thought that that was a sign of me like not being a productive member of <laughs> society, um, but I've just kind of learned to work with my chronotype instead of hating. I muted myself, sorry. Um, and then the thing that has not served me well, um, I think probably has been um, sometimes not knowing about my own capacity. Um, so not permitting myself to get enough rest um, because I find it important to try and like show up for all of the communities that are important to me um, when they need it, but it can be I think really difficult to balance that with work, with you know all of these other things, TAing, et cetera. And so knowing when to allow myself the time to rest, I think is really important or just like screw around and not make everything really serious sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Alea, that was very interesting. Uh, okay, same, same question to you now, um, Taya. Can you uh, name three skills that have served you well as an artist and maybe one that hasn't? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I think, you know, growing up in a creative family and with a mom that is in the same industry as me has has been just invaluable. And um, I don't struggle a lot with the creative side of the business. That part comes easy for me. And, you know, I, I always, I feel like I have an endless supply of design ideas. The, the hard part is kind of having the time and the money and the energy to 
work on new collections. So I'm always grateful for that because I talk to other people in the industry and they might feel like they're having a creative block and I usually have too many ideas. So that, I and mean, that's been great. And then also for me, the entrepreneurial side is really tied to the creativity for me. And I think that um, I'm grateful that I found that side of it interesting. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work to do on both sides, you know, the business side and the creative side. So I, I find it interesting when those two intersect and figuring out, you know, what, what areas I want to focus on and what paths I want to go down has been really great. Um, and then also to go back to what Aaliyah was saying, like the editing process for me is just so important. And I, I think that a, that really is a skill I learned at Reed, uh, especially when I was writing my thesis. I wrote a creative thesis. Uh, it was a collection of personal essays. And I was so excited by how they transformed through the editing process and became so much better with other people's input, my thesis advisor, as well as friends. And, and so I, I bring that same kind of energy when I make a new collection of jewelry and I will, I'll make a huge collection. And then once I'm kind of done with it, I'll take it to my staff and, you know, to my friends or family and get their feedback. And it's only when, you know, a lot of times we'll come up with a much stronger collection through that editing process. And it will also help me double down on, you know, if someone has negative feedback, I'll realize, no, I really do love it this way. And so that's, that's kind of how I, I come to see which designs I really feel strongly about and which ones I don't. So I love doing that. And then as far as a weakness goes, I think that when you're in a creative industry and you're thinking about, um, you know, either working for someone else or bringing people on to work with you, it can be incredibly challenging to imagine how you're going to delegate these things that are, you know, they're so personal and they're, they're part of your creative vision and your aesthetic vision. And it can be really challenging to think about how can, how could anyone else replicate that? Or how could you bring them on board to work harmoniously with you? And that's been something that I've struggled with. Um, and then every time I bring a new staff member on, it always turns out to be so wonderful. So it's this lesson I have to learn over and over again that it actually makes the work stronger when there are more people working together. And it can kind of feel like, I, I think about Reed a lot, especially because my, um, the manager at our business is also a Reedy, Lindsay Swanson, 06. And so a lot of nights will be up late working on new collections or working on displays. And it kind of feels like we're back in the library and having fun and collaborating. So, you know, every time we bring on a new employee, I'll think like, oh, how can they, you know, take this thing off my plate? And, and usually they take it off my plate and it becomes even better than it was before because they have more time and energy to work on it. And everyone is, you know, they want to do a good job and they're dedicated to a good product and good output. So that is something that I struggle with that you know, it always, it always seems to work out and I'm excited to keep learning about that. Okay, yeah, well, thanks, well, thanks Chad for sharing all of that. Uh, so I have another question as an outsider looking into the creative process and this one goes to Dave. And you know, I speak as someone who's not creative at least not in the artistic sense. And what I wanna ask you Dave is what, what do you see as some of the challenges that creatives face that those of us who are not creative like me simply don't understand or appreciate? Well, so first of all, I think one of the most important things that you have to realize as an artist and as someone from the outside is you may not be able to appreciate what the person has done. Um, and they don't always appreciate how much work it takes. I know Taya puts a lot of effort into her art, for example. And so when a customer comes in and doesn't like something, I can see that that, that can be a very personal rejection in some ways. Um, and it's happened to me too. I've, I've been at events where someone would walk away from 
seeing a peace of mind that I thought was priced way too low with $200. And they say, oh, oh, it's pretty, but I don't know if it's worth $200. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, the response that was coming out of my mouth at that point is not polite company words, but, um, you know, it's the kind of thing that can be very uh, devastating to you. Um, so that's a challenge sometimes. However, I will take a little bit of an exception, Govin, to the second part of your question. I will argue that everyone is creative, even artistically. Um, I, I think a lot of people that say that they are not creative, it's because they've really never been given a chance to be creative. Um, and some of that's the fault of our schooling system where art is not taught anymore or largely not taught anymore. Um, and they just don't have exposure to it. Um, you know, I, I, I don't draw, for example. Um, that doesn't mean I don't have creative skills that way. It just means I haven't had exposure to it. I don't have, I haven't been taught how to do it. Um, and I would say that um, it's just a matter of exposure. I think everyone has a, some degree of artistic creativity um, that it may be quote less or more than someone else, but a large time that those people that say they're not creative, I think are just, in my opinion, wrong. Um, and if it were up to me, I would say that, you know, just as the non-science majors that read have to take some sort of science, I would say that those that are science majors should have to take some sort of art. Um, that would be my plug for uh, changes at the read curriculum. But, um, you know, I, I think there's um, lots to understand. I mean, I'm reviewing some artistic um, proposals right now for a local, local arts organization. And there's stuff that I don't like because it's just not my thing. Um, but I do take some time to, you know, look at those and try to figure out, well, what did they do here? Um, how is it creative? and not be critical just because I don't particularly like the fact that they used a bunch of plastic bags, for example, to make something. Okay, well, thank you, Dave. That's very uh, encouraging and, you know, also food for thought in terms of, you know, how we look at art that may not strike us, uh, at least initially or in a, in a gut sense, uh, you know, as being particularly you know, attractive. Um, so let me now ask the question that we always ask in this panel, because it interests us all as readies, whatever our career interest. And I would like to ask this one, and particularly from your standpoint as a creative um, artist, what was your, what, what is the biggest takeaway from uh, your read education that has helped in your career? Uh, let's start with you, Alea. I think the biggest takeaway for me oh, would have to be I think like my love of research um, and like loving research, like loving to really dig deep into a project or into something and having that be a process that drives you. Um, being able to, even if it's imperfect, um, dedicate oneself to something uh, for the duration, I think is really, really um, important when it comes to choosing a creative career. And I feel like that's making it through read is something that definitely required, I think, a dedication to a number of different long-term projects and an interest in digging deep into research and getting to know everything I could know about um, what was of interest to me. Um, being interested in things, I feel like, is not something that I mean, not to be like, not everyone is interested in things, but not, not everyone is interested in things and being really interested in things, I think is part of what makes, you know, art that really clicks for me. Um, you know, it's, it's that it's interesting. And like part of what's interesting not to like get too solipsistic is that, you know, I think it's really important to be able to meet for me with like a research oriented practice. I think it's it's necessary to really, be able to nerd out really hard and do a lot of research and figure things out and read and and explore and make mistakes widely. Um, it's really the the process of doing research, I feel like, um, not necessarily where a thesis comes out at the end, but this process where, you know, maybe it's a film, maybe it's, you know, glass pieces that are inspired by tree bark and you have to like experiment and do research, you know, like that's something I think that's really important and that has stuck with me over time. Well, thank you. That's, that's a very, that's a very interesting interpretation um, of your read experience. Uh, very helpful. Uh, Maritza, any, any thoughts on this? 
Sure. Um, I guess uh, two things kind of come to mind. Um, you know, one part of my read experience was, uh, you know, being part of the LSU, the Latino Student Union. And um, while I was there, I also started a uh, the revolutionary study group. Um, and I think connecting with people like on the individual level, that's like, in a, you know, just like a one on one, like constructive, meaningful way, I feel like is something that really influenced me. Um, just knowing the power of like connection with individual people and like what that has. And if you, yeah. Um, and another thing I guess also is just, you know, getting through read was very, very challenging for me. Almost considered dropping out a couple times, but uh, you know, the fact that I was able to finish and uh, really have a better understanding of like who I am as an individual and knowing, just having a confidence that if I set myself to something, um, I know that I can do it. And I feel like, especially with, um, you know, the trajectory of my career before doing art, you know, was very not conventional and uh, took me to some pretty wild places. I guess you can see some bears here being shared from some of my remote work in other parts of Alaska. Um, but yeah, just, you know, having that kind of self-worth um and feeling like you know if you set your heart to it you can do it and i feel like that's been super valuable for all of my big life choices great marissa thank you you know one of the reasons i i love doing these kinds of events is i always find no two readings are ever the same it doesn't matter your major your year uh you know you get different perspectives and yet there is something of a common denominator across our experiences. Okay, same question, uh, Dave, over to you. So um, a lot of what I have to say about this is probably a lot of what Aaliyah has already said. So thank you very much for Aaliyah for doing that. Um, I would say that the ability to experiment and document that experiment has been very helpful. Um, so for when you're working with Glass and as she mentioned, the uh, the uh, working with the uh, the bark in or glass into bark, it required a lot of experimentation, a lot of notes, um, a lot of practice, a lot of mistakes, um, and you have to accept sometimes that mistakes are going to happen. Um, I was going to show you some of the mistakes, but I figured that would take too much time. But believe me, there were some puzzles in the kiln where it was just like, ah, you know, um, and not useful. So Reed kind of helped me you know, get through that process, recognize that mistakes are gonna happen, that it's not the worst thing in the world. And in fact, that sometimes mistakes can be great. Um, and, you know, I, I started out as a chemistry major and ended up in psychology, but there was a lot of transitions in there and that, and that really reflects the way my life has gone as well. Um, I've worked in retail, I've worked um, for myself, um, I've done just about anything and everything. And I think the fact that um, re prepares you for those transitions somewhat well um, is a good thing. Okay, great, Dave. Thank you. That, that was very thoughtful. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, uh, Taya, would you like to close off this question with uh, your thoughts? Sure. Yeah. Um, I feel like I mean it's it's hard to explain because I feel like every day I'm using skills I learned at Reed in weird and unexpected ways. But um, I definitely feel like my experience at Reed gave me kind of the confidence to tackle, like I think when you're in the art world and in the business world, you feel like you're just making stuff up as you go along. And Reed kind of gave me the confidence to feel like okay with that. And to feel like when challenges come up, I can, you know, read a bunch of articles and look at some books and just kind of decide, yeah, maybe I think this book is, has good advice, or maybe I think it has shitty advice. Like, I'm just gonna make it up as I go along and, and, you know, learn as much as I can and 
and then take it from there. So I really, I, I don't think that I would have that same feeling if I didn't go to Reed. And I love, I, my community from Reed is so great too. I, I still, I talk to all my friends about every business decision I'm making and they've been so endlessly helpful and supportive. And Portland overall is a really supportive community. So that's been great. And um, I run into Reedies all the time here, which is always fun and surprising. And I, I had a pretty unique experience at Reed too. I think I took a lot away from the jobs that I had while I worked there. I, I worked, I was an SU cleaner. So the SU is kind of its own little small business and it's not run by the college, it's run by the students. And, and then I also worked in the bio stock room, which was a really fun experience, like watching how they kept up on their inventory and filling orders for professors and and then my senior year, I was the manager at the Paradox, which is a student run coffee shop. So that was an amazing kind of like compressed business class in and of itself, because I was 21 years old and I had 32 employees and they, no one was watching what I was doing or telling me how to do it. And so that was a really great experience, just figuring out, you know, how to run a profit and loss statement, which I had no idea about. So I kind of, I think I got a lot of extras that read beyond just my classes and that has been really helpful as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Taya. Um, I, I wanna give some um, our audience a bit of a chance to engage uh, with our panelists. Um, and uh, I think we have some questions from our Q&A. Let me hand this over to Katie, uh, who's um, uh, who's monitoring uh, our chat and questions. Yeah, absolutely. We've definitely got a few. So um, the first one is from another artist that's here with us tonight. So quote, coming from a family background of financial instability, I have a lot of guilt around choosing a creative profession, being a freelancer. I feel anxious about financial planning for the future when I can't predict my own income from month to month. Do any of you wrestle with these concerns and how do you deal with the lack of structure, consistency, predictability, all of it? Okay, uh, who would like to take that one on? I mean, I, I do think that going down this path, uh, there is a certain amount of financial instability and I've certainly felt that uh, for a lot of years, you know, there, there are ups and downs and I think it can be hard to justify to, uh, you know, friends or family members who are on that really straight and narrow path with the retirement fund and, you know, pension and all that. But I think if you work really hard at it and you make sure you're taking care of yourself and you evaluate what's working and what isn't working. I think that at the end of the day, I mean, I have to tell myself I have no one else to answer to but myself and that's a hard place to get to, but it's been endlessly freeing. And I think that if you can make a path forward, make your art, your career and make that work for you, I, you know, people do it all the time and having a strong community can help you figure out how to do it so that it is financially possible. Okay, well, thank you, uh, uh, Taya. So, Anyone Govind, else on this yeah. question? Yeah, I'd like to say something too, Govin. Um, I would say just because you're in the artistic field and relatively young, don't feel that your, your feelings of insecurity are just because you're in the artistic field. They are not. I assure you people coming out of Reed this year are in the same exact boat. Um, you know, it, and we all have that. Um, so j do know that there are people that are out there feeling the same sort of thing. Um, and it doesn't always go away, that's true. Um, I suspect that Taya, for example, probably feels that more on a day-to-day -day basis than most of us because she's actually running a business in an actual location. Um, you know, I work out of the house, so I have an advantage in that sense. Um, so please don't feel like you're alone. I think to that, I would add um, that for me, as someone who has worked freelance, um, but also has had jobs, like you don't have to freelance before, like you don't have to full-time freelance before you're ready. Um, 
having a job is something that I've used as a way to support the other work that I do. And that's been super helpful. Um, for me, you know, that's sometimes, I mean, it really varies. It's meant having jobs sometimes where I don't do a lot of writing um, so that I can preserve that energy for writing when I want to um, for my actual career. Like I was just driving the writer Chris Abani to the airport for one of my jobs, right? As like the driver of the international writing program. And he asked me what my work was. And I was talking to him about how I was a writer. And he was like, no, that's your job. Or like, I was talking to him about how I was a driver, um, driving him to the airport, driving other writers to the airport. And he said, no, 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 that's your job. What's your work? And so I feel like as an artist, being able to make a distinction between the jobs that you have to take in order to keep a roof over your head, put food on the table, um, making a distinction between that and the work that you feel called to do, I think is really important. Um, additionally, like this is my third time in grad school. And so sometimes some people go the institutional support route. Um, that's not something that's for everyone. And part of it is that I've always wanted to learn about different disciplines. All of my degrees so far are in different things. But part of it is also that like, if you have a union, like the grad student health insurance tends to be pretty good. It means that if you're a TA, you're getting teaching experience and you're getting a stipend. Um, and so that I think can also be a route to try and carve out some time for experimentation and for focusing a little bit more on work. Um, but other times it's just as simple as like, well, when it's not a pandemic, getting a job as a barista or waiting tables to help mitigate that financial risk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Alea. Uh, anyone else on this question? Yeah, real quick. I just wanted to add, um, I mean, it's also a question that I'm interested in because I still, you know, I haven't fully, fully transitioned to full-time art business. Um, but one thing that really helped me is, um, I mentioned earlier, I, I did a lot of seasonal work <laughs> and, um, and I, you know, being able to have a seasonal position that paid me enough um, allowed me to have like nine to eight months out of the year where I could do art and um, also freelance graphic design on the side. But, uh, you know, I think there's opportunities available that we just, you know, if you haven't heard of it, you don't really know where to look or what to look for. But um, like I was interested in like outdoor work. So I, you know, I've been working for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and that has provided me the freedom to, you know, live that kind of a lifestyle where I get to work seven days a week for a while and then have a lot of other time. But um, yeah, and I don't, I mean, it's, it's tough, it's scary, it's scary, but uh, I really hope that my next chapter of life can be more like, you know, Taya's where it's more full-time art. And um, a lot of times I just reassure myself, you know, I can cook a good meal. I can always cook food and sell it if I have to. But um, I think having different back, like backup plans that like still excite you because it is, you know, really hard to keep your spirit up if you're doing work that is just, you know, soul crushing. <laughs> um and try to trying to do your art at the same time so i think you know making a list of things that excite you that can still provide some income you know are a good a good place to start okay all right thanks uh, thanks marissa um okay shall we move to another question uh katie yeah absolutely so um alia this is definitely for you it might be for some others but um, how did you decide to go to grad school if you did? And was it helpful as an artist or an arts educator? Um, I guess I did fess up to having and put in my bio that I went to grad school a lot of times. Um, yes, in some ways grad school has been helpful. In other ways, grad school um, has not been helpful at all. Um, I'm thinking in particular about kind of my first MFA program. Um, where the network that one gets kind of going to Iowa for writing is really crucial. And I think I was lucky enough to have a number of different colleagues and friends while I was there who really became my readers and helped me to see my work in a brand new way. 
Um, and by, and you know, not only in a brand new way, but for me to see my work as something that had value um, coming into this kind of environment where most people had studied nonfiction as undergraduates, whereas like I had taken like one class with Pete Rock, which was amazing, but it was like a very at the end of the process kind of career turn. Um, so in that way, getting an education in nonfiction writing was super great. And I was also able to explore a lot of my other interests um, in other disciplines. Um, I would say that when I was there, the program was, um, there was not another black person my freshman, my, my freshman, my first year in that program. Um, and that was really, really challenging. And so I think that it's important to think about not only the kind of networks or the kind of skills that we can develop in terms of our research when we go into grad school or the way that we can develop our practices, um, but there are sometimes very real um, issues <laughs> with the kind of social environment that can do more harm than good and also like prevent one from like doing the type of work that one wants to do in the same exact time frame. Um, at the same time, it's like, I would say that as an arts educator, there are programs specifically for arts education um, that I think could be really, really helpful. Um, but for me, because I think of myself as cross-trained in a lot of disciplines, um, going to grad school in different fields has been helpful for kind of fleshing out what my interests are. So it's like, as I'm broadening, I'm also kind of getting more specific in terms of what I wanna make and how I wanna do it. All right, great. Um Katie, there's another question I'd like to ask our panelists, but is, are there, uh, is there one more question uh, from the audience you'd like to throw out? Yeah, we actually have two. Okay, um, let's do it. So real quick, I think we can touch on them. So for those of you who didn't start out in art, how did Reed affect that? So let me uh, answer that if I can, because it sort of segues into the last question as well, because I also went to graduate school. Um, however, I didn't go to graduate school in art or anything like that. So for me personally, it was a mistake. Um, it did not really do anything except add to my debt. Um, it was not a good decision on my part. It wasn't something I was motivated to do. So I think, you know, it's, it's something you have to think about pretty seriously when you do go to grad school. Not sure if I'm fully answering, but maybe someone else can take the rest. Okay. Anyone else? Uh... Do you have another question, Katie? Yeah. Um, so art is a personal endeavor, and you've all shared so much of yourselves tonight. So just curious, what are some tips for self care and coping that have helped you through the pandemic? Yeah. Great question. Yeah, I, I like I'll, I'll answer. I, uh, I think I've gone through phases of being better at it than uh, other times. But I mean, in general, I think when you're in business for yourself, and especially when that's a creative endeavor, it's incredibly hard to have a good work-life balance. And that is a constant struggle for me and something I'm always trying to be better at because I do work on my business every day and I, I think about it usually first thing when I wake up every morning and I do love it, but that can be kind of smothering. So I've gotten better about having a separate studio space that's out of my house and I try not to think about work uh, when I come home for the evening and um, yeah, I just, I think that, you know, taking care of your body is really important when like my uh, art is pretty physically taxing, making jewelry all day. So learning and also, you know, it's important to teach my staff this too, to take stretch breaks and, you know, there's, there are certain exercises you can do and it's, it's you know, we have standing desks now and things like that. It's a, it's a constant work in progress to take care of our bodies while we're making jewelry and, take care of our minds while, you know, when the studio is closed. Um, I don't know that I'm always successful at it, so I'm not the best probably to give advice, but um, it's it was really interesting when the pandemic hit because we closed the studio and the store. So I suddenly had way more time at home than I've had before. And I, I was used to commuting into work six days a week. So 
now that I've gotten used to this being at home life, I'm really trying to be mindful about the way we build the business back up. And I'm hoping that we will get back to our pre COVID numbers. We, uh, in terms of, you know, profit and in terms of staffing, we, you know, we were a team of 10 going into COVID and I had to furlough most of my staff, which was heartbreaking and, you know, to be honest, we, our sales were down more than 80% for six months. So just dealing with that, uh, the stress of it was incredible, but I also found myself having all this free time that I hadn't had for years. And that was also enjoyable. So, you know, dealing with those, the push and pull of that. Um, so now that we're back and, you know, our, our team's back up to seven now, which is really great. I've been able to rehire most people and um, yeah, I just want to be mindful about the way we build it back up so that I'm not doing six days a week. Maybe I can just go in four days a week and work from home one day and just, you know, I just want to take care of myself and take care of my staff and hopefully people will buy jewelry, you know, come out again. So, yeah, I hope that's helpful. Okay, great. Um, um, Katie, unless we have more questions, I'd like to throw a, a final one to our panelists. Do. Okay. All right. Um, now, you know, we've, we've asked our panelists, we've asked all of you to look back at your experience to look at what's going on right now in terms of this very difficult um, situation that the pandemic that we have. And, uh, you know, I'd like to ask a question that's a bit more forward looking. But before that, I want to say you guys have been so great, really. You've brought yourselves, your personalities, your experience, uh, you know, and you know, your experiences difficult and promising into this conversation. I just want to thank you for that. It's very, very heartfelt and you know, it's heartwarming to hear all of this. Now, you're also, I'm sure, very, you know, you're dreamers like all of us, and you look forward to the future. I'd like to know what's coming up for you and what excites you the most uh, about the future. And you know, I'd like uh, each of your perspectives on this. Uh, Dave, shall we start with you? Sure. Um, and let me take a ch chance to say, Govan, thank you for doing this as well. Um, many of us in the alumni community know, know what you do and we appreciate it very much. So on behalf of them, please accept our thanks. Um, but to answer your question, um, so a lot of what I'm trying to work on now is transitioning much of my um, work and or instructional stuff into uh, the virtual realm. So I'm doing a lot of that. Um, and also to answer um, Katie's question a minute ago about self-care, one of the things I've started doing is actually getting my telescope out and using it. Um, so you, the image behind me, for example, right now is an image that I took of the moon with the telescope. Um, and it, it helps me sort of not stress about the fact that I'm not working as much as I would like, um, that I'm not doing something productive because I am doing something productive, something productive that I want to do. Um, and that helps a lot. Um, I'm teaching a class in the spring at Montgomery College virtually about um, how to use Etsy. So it's going to be um, like a how-to class essentially in marketing information, things like that. And I'm also going to launch probably between now and the end of the year, um, a Redbubble um, store, I guess you would call it. Um, because one of the things people do tell me sometimes is that my, they like my photography. And because of that, I'm getting it printed on things like mugs and face masks and you know all those things that we all want to have in our homes right now. Um, so that's kind of what I'm doing going in the future. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, Alia, uh, what does the future look like uh, to you? How do you see it? Um, so I have, let's see, it's almost the end of the fall quarter. So I have a little over a year to, uh, and a half left in grad school. Um, so eventually looking towards like a thesis show. Um, but for right now, I'm really um, kind of digging deep into pre-production on a long form film um, that's thinking about kind of queer, black femme, contemplation, rest, um, work, and relation, um, in addition to kind of activities of daily living and um, neurodivergence. And so that's a project that I'm super excited about. Um, 
I, <laughs> this is like the kind of, this is the first thing I've really taken on of this nature. And so it's fascinating to see what parts of production have been interesting, the most interesting to me, like the most immediately. Um, of course, costumes <laughs> and thinking about flowers and gardens. Um, so that has been um, really exciting, uh, even though I generally don't feel excitement um, as a kind of orientation towards emotions and reality. Thank you. Thank you, Alea. Uh, Maritza, uh, what are you excited about in the future? I am, um, I'm actually really, really, really excited. Um, I guess I mentioned earlier, you know, I just, I just, uh, I just finished this Kickstarter for the Gentle Tarot, this tarot deck that I just finished. Um, and I'm really excited because I, I I have yet to actually have the final product in my hand. It's all been just, you know, me creating nonstop. And um, I have some samples that I printed here at home. Um, hmm. The finals are not gonna look like that. They're gonna, I mean, yeah, but I'm just, I'm really excited for those to get here to me. And um, I have a bunch of other creations that I've been making to go along with the gentle tarot. I'm in the process of um, designing and having some um, organic cotton like session cloths, bandanas essentially. And um, yeah, I've just been designing away and I've never, I've never had such a productive like chapter in my creative life, creative career as now. Um, and having, you know, these things take physical form and already have a bunch of people signed up that bought it already is just very, very exciting. And I, I, um, I actually ended up using almost all of the Kickstarter money um, because I was overfunded to purchasing like extra inventory. So I'm really taking the plunge and risking kind of it all. And I really hope to see it um, come to life and bloom and launch me forward. So hoping for the best. Oh, great. Well, you know, good luck. <laughs> Very good. Good luck to you, definitely. Uh, Taya, what's, uh, what's exciting you about the future? Um, well, I'm so excited to be working with my staff again. And we, as I've already mentioned, we just opened a store in Selwood, which we're super excited about. And so just, you know, merchandising the store and setting it up was really fun. And we've been open for three weeks now and it's been going great. It's a really awesome neighborhood, very supportive. So that's really exciting. And we're just, you know, always, we're pivoting to more online sales. So we're just designing new pieces and getting them online as we can. And I feel excited. I, I feel really excited. The momentum feels good right now. And just the news of the vaccine, it feels like we're going to make it through and come out on the other side even stronger. So I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm here for the ride, but trying to steer the ship while I can, I guess. Yeah, well, well, thank you all. No, really, that's very inspiring, very positive very energetic, very creative. Uh, thank you. Katie, um, I'm going to hand it over to you for any last points, and then I might just uh, say one or two words to close up, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. So um, thank you all. Govin, thank you for bringing this panel to life. And to all the panelists, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time and your insight and your advice tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, I love the timing of this panel with the holidays coming up. So I encourage everybody in attendance to think about supporting our Reedy artists. If you're planning to give gifts over the next few months, it's so important in this time to support our independent businesses. Um, you can find even more on our Reedy owned business directory on alumni.read.edu. Um, just a couple housekeeping things before you go, we'll be sending out a survey tomorrow to gather feedback on tonight's talk. We always appreciate your thoughtful feedback and ideas for future talks. Um, and stay tuned for more virtual events from the Reed Career Alliance in the coming months. And you can always stay connected to activities um, through Reed by visiting our Reed Remote website. And Govind, back to you. Okay, thank you. And uh, everybody, please um, uh, look at all these wonderful links from our wonderful panelists. There, there's a lot more that I think they could have said, they could have shared. 
that's a little di difficult for such a visual subject matter, you know, to do it over Zoom. Uh, but you know, this has been very engaging. Uh, really, I, I want to thank all our panelists uh, from the bottom of my heart because this is what makes these events work. It is your generosity, your with your time, uh, your energy, your creativity. Uh, you know, all these e events are, are animated very much by uh, by this. Uh, let me do a quick commercial for some coming events. I hope we can put together uh, a future event, maybe over Paideia on unexpected career pathways. We're working on that. I feel like you know, I could have renamed this panel uh, unexpected career pathways in some sense. Um, it's been very inspiring. We hope to do uh, another panel on sustainability, uh, maybe one on medical professions down the road, but there are other ideas coming up. Uh, we have several members now of our alumni board who are getting involved in this. And, uh, you know, we hope that this is going to take a life of its own because one of the best ways to talk about careers at Reed, I think, is to get to know our alums who have engaged themselves in the professional world and who can bring to us their insights about their pathways, um, their experiences, their insight on issues, and on what Reed has or maybe has not meant. Uh, to all of this. So thank you all. Please stay well. Uh, and thanks to our panel once again for a very inspiring message. Uh, stay well, everybody. Goodbye.